Hey there, Resume Leslie here, and thank you so much for joining us on this Career Tip Tuesday. Today is actually Friday. We push Career Tip Tuesday this week to Friday because we are super excited about our guest, and she had a scheduling conflict Tuesday, so we move things around to have her here. Hey, Nia too, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm super excited today because I solved the issue of my AirPods falling out finally. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. I picked that up these really little guys cool. right here. And so you will not see me like touch my ears like every three to five minutes during the broadcast <laughs> today. So it's all about the little things sometimes. And so that's one of the little things making me really happy this week. Nice. Well, very cool. I'm glad you got that figured out. I know those little annoyances sometimes will really get to you. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Hey there to our audience. Thank you so much for being here. Go ahead and drop us a comment in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. If you're catching a replay, let us know that you're catching the replay. We have, let's see, Bet, I believe that's how you pronounce it, from Ventura, Ventura California. Good to see you. We've got Justine here from Toronto. Excellent to see you as well. Hey, Brittany from St. Cloud, Minnesota. Rita, again, that's a familiar name and face. It's awesome to see you. Hey there, Philip. Great to see your positivity in here today as well. That is fantastic. My partner, Andy Shears, is in the chat. He will be helping us try to uh, highlight any questions that come from the audience today and uh, perhaps sharing any links that come up that might be helpful and things like that. He says to be sure to follow our guest, Shauna Cole. So definitely make sure you do that. Um, just to let everyone know, our guest today is a very busy person. So she has a little bit of a time constraint today. So we're going to be moving quickly and trying to keep things to about 45 minutes. Um, if you have questions, as always, include them in the chat. And Nia, too, what's that tip that you tell everybody for the questions? Sure. Uh, please type in all caps the word question before your question to make Andy's life and Leslie's way easier and spotting your question and hopefully bring it up during today's conversation. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. So be sure to get your questions in. Type that word question in all caps at the beginning so we see it better. And just to let you know, since we're keeping things short today, if we don't get to your question, our guest today, Shauna, has agreed to meet up with me afterwards. I'm going to get to any questions that aren't answered today. I'm going to get with her get her answers to them, and then we'll post about it and make sure that everybody sees that. So if your question's not answered live, she will definitely get to it. Okay, with that said, let's go ahead and get her in here. So Shauna Cole is our guest today. Shauna is the creator of Career Interrupted, where she empowers racialized newcomer and minority professionals to overcome invisible barriers in job search and careers. Prior to becoming a coach, Shauna spent six years in various progressively responsible HR roles, and we are just super excited to have her. So without further ado, do I will bring in Shauna. Hey, Welcome Shauna. Hey. Thanks so much for having me, guys, and thanks for doing this on a Friday. I know, uh, I know, you're usually like Tuesday schedule. I so <laughs> appreciate you doing this on Friday, so uh, so we can connect with your audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. We're super excited having you on and doing a slight schedule change to get on a great guest is no big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and so staying faithful to what we set up front, let's go ahead and dive right in and get to some really uh, meaty topics and try to have a very direct conversation about what might be some potentially difficult issues. But I think through practice, through being transparent and vulnerable, we can model how to have such a conversation and hopefully make it less fraught and less challenging for people to have because it is necessary and so we need to just lean in and get it done um so with that you said that. yeah awesome awesome so with that said um you identify as biracial and you recently wrote a post about being an un unintentional and unlikely spy in quotes um because visually people assume that you're white uh, can you share a bit about how your identity has influenced your career progression and how your experiences um and and uh, how do you see empathy being a useful tool in fighting discrimination? Yeah, I think 
The, the racial identity one, uh, conversation is an interesting one that I, I think we actually don't talk about enough. The world is changing in a lot of different ways and, and things just aren't as straightforward as, um, as, as they used to be when it comes to identifying um, someone's background. So, so yes, yeah, some people, some people assume I'm white. Some people assume I'm not from my city. They say, Oh, there's something not quite white about her. Right. So I did face like a fair amount of assumptions um, throughout my life. And a lot of the times it was contextual or perhaps based on that other person's experience or perception of me. This growing up was really difficult. And I, I guess I didn't realize how much these challenges around my racial identity would go on to impact my professional career as well. And living in a community that's primarily white with white leaders yeah, I was totally a spy because I would hear some really awful stuff behind closed doors. So literally mm -hmm. behind the, the hiring process. Um, and people, I, I don't know why anyone would assume that's okay to stay in front of me um, for, for a lot of different reasons. And people would be comfortable to say things. So for example, I, I posted on, on LinkedIn and it actually went viral a year back. This experience I had when I actually heard a hiring manager drop the N-word in, in a screening process. All of these things impacted my professional career. What I wish I had done differently was I wish I had been more firm and clear and vocal in my identity earlier on. But I think that's something that only time, experience, and maturity um, and maturity brought to me. So, so I think I think the identity conversation is really a difficult and complicated one, not only for mm -hmm. me, but for anyone, anyone who struggles with that background piece. Sometimes it's hard to get in touch with, with where we come from. Um, so, so in terms of, in terms of empathy, I believe that em empathy is kind of just simply put like that is where it's at in terms of affecting um, positive change is literally putting ourselves in the other person's shoes and understanding, listening to rather their perspective. We might not necessarily understand or have seen it ourselves, um, but I think empathy is really the key to, um, to changing things and hiring processes and improving the situation um, for minority job seekers as well. Like moving beyond this whole idea of gaslighting, like, like let's pretend it's not happening, which is what I mm. face primarily in my professional career. Mm. You're crazy. Mm. That's not happening. <laughs> why is every dude in leadership always white? And why have I never seen a visible minority? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay, I guess I'm making it up. So anyways, right. I, I think that recognizing and listening to the stories and instead of telling me I'm wrong and it never happened... Like, let's say, okay, I'm sorry that was your experience and take, take a lesson away from it. You know, thank you so much for leaning into that and just being transparent about how uh, someone navigating identity for any of us, it doesn't necessarily matter which identities we carry, but especially racial identity can be a very challenging process. And if you identify as biracial or if you're intersectional in different ways, that adds layers of complexity in terms of how you come into the understanding of yourself how to navigate spaces as you spoke about, you know, perhaps wishing you'd been more vocal at those, uh, in those earlier stages in your career. Uh, we also have to think about safety in terms of vocalizing your uh, resistance to or disapproval of certain things happening in front of you. And so certainly that was, that was quite a challenging thing. And on the empathy front, I just want to insert a note. Um, I learned recently uh, this framework where there are three different types of empathy. There's cognitive empathy, which is really just the, the act of imagining what someone's going through, the one that we're all very familiar with. There's also emotional empathy, which is thinking about uh, getting into the, the feelings of the person. Can you feel what they're feeling? That brings you into closer alignment with that individual. And finally, there's compassion empathy. How can I help? What am I going to do about it? And so I think a critical issue in society right now is the empathy gap. And so for us getting from cognitive empathy, which is the, the entry point, to compassion empathy, which is moving to action. And so if I can just put that plug for all of us to work towards compassion empathy and being spurred to action through empathy, that's where we can really start to make some change in corporate spaces and in the broader public. Oh, that is like, that is so important and, and so powerful because when I, when I think of that moment, when I'm sitting in the board room and I hear uh, a hiring manager, quite frankly, drop the end bomb in front of me, like there's a 
feeling that mm-hmm. goes along with that, that pit in your stomach feeling of like, I was like, you're literally, you're insulting me. You're hurting me. You're hurting, you're hurting my dad. You're hurt. like, I, I felt this extreme hurt in that mm-hmm. moment. And then I felt like angry. And then it was like, why am I working here? There were a set of emotions that went along with that. Those emotions were uniquely mine in that experience. And yes, deeply tied to my racial identity. But to your point around, around empathy, anyone could feel those feelings, mm-hmm. right? So, and, and you're so right. It's, and it's once we can get in tune, like with, geez, I don't know what it felt like to be Shauna in that seat at that moment. Mm-hmm. But I did have this experience in my life that led me to feel insulted, angry, what, whatever the gamut is. Um, yeah, I think totally that's, that's a path to affecting some real change as well. And an important thing for us to all, all strive for. Awesome. Yeah. Those are really, really deep emotions to dive into, Shauna. And I really appreciate your willingness to share it with us, but also the way that you just share it so much on your platform. I think it's really important and, and, and really special that you're willing and, and able to do that. Thank you. All right, moving into the next question. So in that same post that we were just talking about for Nia Tu's question, um, you advocate for sharing experiences as a way to find common ground, which is obviously, you know, something big that you do with your platform. How can job seekers employ those ideas in their job search to find or vet companies, jobs, um, to make sure those opportunities are really, truly a good fit for them um, as professionals and also as people? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I think as a job seeker, particularly if you've got a, you've got a set of values and beliefs and you know, um, you know what you want from a company. It's hard to articulate at times, but there are ways, I think, that we can see it like visually. Um, one thing that makes me cringe, and I, I think particularly if if you are in a minority group and minorities come in all different shapes, sizes, colors, religions, creeds, genders, like the whole gamut of minorities, if you are in a minority group, I think one really quick way to sort of assess whether or not that employer is going to be a fit is to like, just like pop on over, take a look at that leadership team and see what is up on that photo of the leadership team. And look for for representation. I know for me personally, in the market area that I'm in, it's not we're we're growing in terms of our, our diversity, um, but it's not an extremely diverse region. So I I do often cringe when I look at photos of boards and leadership teams because it's it is so same after same after same, and people literally like look the same a lot. Of, like there is a look for a leader in this market area, right? So, anyways. As a, as a job seeker, I would absolutely take a look and see there's a superficial stuff that's going on online that can send you some signals about whether or not that employer is perhaps aligned with, with your viewpoint. And then I think the other thing that, um, that can be really important is like, like how they're showing up online as well. Um, like I think of, I can think of examples kind of you know how we were all like kind of watching everyone when everything was happening with BLM in the early days to see like, what you going to do? Are you going to say something? And we had, we saw influencers kind of making some really significant missteps or whatever. Um, that to me was like a really telling time for, 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 um, for organizations. So I would absolutely, if I was looking for work and I really want to find work that's aligned with my value system and aligned with a belief in diversity and inclusion, I would absolutely take a look and see how they're showing up online. Um, and for me, there's this point in time where you can see how people relate it through the BLM movement, whether they were sincere, committed, or if they felt they were, you felt, you can feel it when they like went to their PR department and it's like, oh, we got this BS BLM thing that we got to do something about. Like, can you put together a post? You can pretty much feel that in their, their content. I would take all those steps um, to do research, to learn about the company before I, um, before I went ahead and decided whether or not they're, they're going to be a fit for me. And there's several different dynamics to it. It's not only um, sort of the, the diversity component, but there's some lifestyle pieces to check it out and see if they're going to support your, your work-life blend or balance or however you choose to, to define it. Um, and I think in terms of, of using stories like to, to share 
um, to share our, our um, experiences rather. I, I think that this is like a deeply personal thing for people. Some people are going to be totally cool with, uh, with sharing their, their personal stories and experiences through their employment search journey. And some people aren't going to be cool with that. And some industries are going to be cool with it. And then some industries aren't going to be cool with it. So I believe if you've got a really, really relevant piece of experience, and perhaps it's not from this job market or from a diverse industry or, or what have you, um, I think it's worth sharing if it's related to what you're applying for. Um, but likewise, I don't think that we should ever engage in conversations or sharing information that we aren't feeling good in our own skin um, sharing with others. I think that's really, really important. That sort of closing thought that you have is that, yes, it's important to do these things. Yes, it can be really good for you. Um, but if it's not good for you, that's okay too. It's about taking that sort of inventory and assessment of what's important to you um, and what's necessary in order for you to find the right alignment and to find the right employer or, or really anything in life. So I really like that you close with that. Um, overall, it sounds like um, basically you're saying don't necessarily take a company at its word, dig deeper, call them, you know, on their words and see if they're actually backing up those words with actions, um, which I really, really like. And I think that's super important. Um, we have a question from Marnie that I think is a really good one that goes along with this. Marnie wants to know, what are your thoughts on strategies to actually moving women and BIPOC into positions of power? Um, Marnie says, although I appreciate the effort on my employer, on my employer's part uh, in offering culture corner chats, uh, diversity spotlights, et cetera, but it's all very surface level. I'm so eager to see women and BIPOC leaders in local, middle and high level management. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so with you on that. Yes. And you know what? When you say like it's it's so surface level, like don't you literally think your employer has a checklist? They're like, we got these four KPIs here around diversity and we got to offer this X amount of programming. And it, there's something kind of transactional about it. I think, um, I don't know, maybe this is out there but i i think i i think that we need to reshape like this diversity and inclusion conversation from kind of like this program approach which is what we typically do from having like targets around it which we, which we typically do to talk about diversity and inclusion as a leadership skill because let's be real we are never going to see bipoc people we're not going to see more women in positions of power if the people in positions of power now do not put them there <laughs> like we're going to wait so long i think people who are in positions of power right now today need to say, okay, we accept that as leaders, there's always going to be stuff we have to work on, right? And we accept that this whole idea of leadership is kind of ebb and flow and it's not perfect. It's an abstract comment. Yet we still are like diversity and inclusion program, check, check, check. Let's be real about it. Diversity and inclusion is a leadership capability, not some freaking $200,000 program you got to go pop buy from some um, some high powered consulting firm, in my opinion, in my opinion, that's what needs to happen. I think, you know what, I think these surface level activities are necessary. Like, I, I think it's like a first step. But to your point, I think it lacks depth. I think all the conversations that we're having around this continue to lack depth. I think a lot of times even the career space, like we're having a, a great in depth conversation about this today. But often, often, career coaches don't even go this deep to, to acknowledge this part of the process. So I think as part of all of our leadership journeys, we need to put on our checklist along with like being strong communicators and leading towards a vision and all the other stuff. I was going to swear there because I'm a swearer, but I held back all the other stuff. <laughs> All the other stuff that happens, I think on that list, we need to put diversity and inclusion and accept that we don't wake up one day and cross it off as a skill, but accept that this is an ongoing journey in our education and, and self-improvement as leaders. 
Right. So snaps on Marnie's question for sure. Snaps on the response. And uh, one I saw a post, I think it was last week by a gentleman named uh, Cam Snaith. I do some consulting work with his company. And he wrote about, uh, to your point, how cultural intelligence was a label that he's putting on. Putting on it, I might even call it cultural competency or cultural agility, should be a leadership competency that is standard and required today going forward because leaders need to have it to adapt to the changing marketplace that's currently happening, the, the demographic shifts, the values that the workforce are currently putting forward. They need to be in alignment with those. And within his post, he also mentioned that BIPOC individuals, we inherently have those capabilities because we have to have those capabilities to survive in a majority white culture. We have to be able to adapt, to code switch, to get along with diverse groups of people as individuals come from marginalized or minority backgrounds. And so promote BIPOC and women into those uh, leadership positions because they inherently will have those skills and will be able to move your organizations forward in those areas. Um, yes. So <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Can I add something to that? Because like, yeah, sure. I, like, like, it's such an important thing. And I, like, I'll give you an example that I faced. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail to what the situation is for reasons. So I, I'm in a situation often where it's like a group setting. And in that group setting, I am with folks from around the world. I look around that room and I am the closest thing to white there. Everybody's brown, black, like everybody. It's a diverse group of people, non-Canadians. And each and every year, there's kind of this event that goes along with this group. And this group is to do these presentations to a group of community leaders, local community leaders. When I look at this room, something to me, as someone who, yeah, I'm biracial, I identify as BIPOC, I'll be real, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a minority, my own stretch, right? I identify as BIPOC. As someone at the, in the minority seat, I look around this room and I, for me, it is so disconnected. I, I would be kind of like the group of leaders in the room. I, and I see all these individuals from all around the world, diverse backgrounds, presenting now to this group of local community leaders who are all white. And when this session is organized every year, I always think to myself, how do the organizers not see that we're lacking representation on this side of the table? And I think that's exactly what you're, what you're touching on. It's like, I see it because I've lived it, but they don't see it because they haven't yeah. lived it. I'm like, dude, something's yeah. missing here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and to, to go into more practical exploration in this conversation, um, you've written and you speak a lot about issues around recruitment bias, um, and which is the practical manifestation of who's going to be in the room and represented in what seats. Um, can you share from your experiences, personal or professional, how you've seen a recruitment bias uh, manifest? Yeah. Um, in like, I mean, it's, it's disturbing. Like I'm, I'm there, there's, there's nothing good about this. Um, Recruitment bias is there. And then people will say, oh my gosh, but Shauna, like there's laws and legislation in place to like protect people. And I'm like, ain't no, nobody from, uh, from the government sitting in these boardroom meetings to regulate and govern that, discuss uh, that discussion. That's, that's just silly. Um, so when it comes to matters of recruitment bias, well, my, this, this really pointed example that I give is I literally have sat in a room and heard a manager go like, oh, no. This guy sounds like he's an N-word, so I'm going to screen him out because he doesn't sound like a fit for my team. And then there's much more overt and sort of quiet ways that recruitment bias might show up, right? I, I got to a point um, where I was observing it in my career because I want to look good as the recruiter, right? Like I'm just graduating from school. My first job is, is recruiter. I want to go to that hiring manager and I want to impress him. And I will say him because it's was often him in my industry. And I will go with my resumes and I want to impress. And because that resume got screened out of this guy with a foreign sounding name, got screened out of the process, it bred this whole sort of attitude and behavior in that recruitment team to be like, it's an international person. Their name doesn't sound local. We should probably just screen screen them out. Let's just not even bring them to the hiring manager because that looks better for me as the recruiter. So uh, there are deep ways that this bias breeds um, like unjustness for minorities inside of the process. That's just one example. You hear, you hear things like, oh, you know what? 
she has young kids. She has some young kids. This position require, requires travel. Let's just screen her out of, of the process. And these are the ways that recruitment bias shows up in the process um, that are, are so, so damaging um, to minorities in the job search. They're just so damaging because at this point, like this guy, he's not even getting a shot in, in the process. Like he's not even getting in front of the hiring manager because of all those assumptions. Um, and I always find it troubling when we have a discussion about job search and we say things like, well, if you write a good resume and a good cover letter, you're going to get an interview and you're going to get a job. And it's like, well, that's true. And your name, if your name is John Smith, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe, but even then maybe someone's going to assume you're 55 and you don't know how to email, right? <laughs> like who, who knows? There, there are all kinds of things that are, that are showing up. And I, and I think the very first thing that we need to, to do as um, as job seekers and as career coaches who are who are leading conversations in this place is to like just be like, whoa, it ain't equal. Like the playing field is not equal when it comes to job search and bias. This whole bias is very, very dangerous, invisible at times, overt at others, but absolutely, absolutely impacts the recruitment process. Right. I mean, what you just shared is really impactful because you're demonstrating how insidious the recruitment bias is. And in the first example, how subconscious, they receive the message based on their superior's reaction to an individual a certain name. And that whether they noted it consciously or not, which maybe they didn't, they began to hold back on passing on candidates with foreign sounding names because of what they'd observed in their leadership. And so this is illustrating the power of leadership the power of actions and the messages those actions therefore convey to those who are uh, executing in the recruitment process. Um, I'll share a very quick story from my my personal life. Um, I was going for a role in a uh, big university in New York City. I had had a wonderful conversation with the uh, career service director who wanted to hire me like right off the bat. And I found out later, he told me, I got this feedback from him that because the head of all career services had previously been burned by someone who needed visa sponsorship, she was no longer open to anyone who needed visa sponsorship ever working at the uh, in the department, even though this director on a campus wants to just give me the job right then and there. And so these things carry forward. Um, and so it's really important to recognize that biases, which we all have, can filter directly into recruiting processes, whether overtly or you know covertly, through actions and messages and things like that. And so because we want to serve our audience, can you provide any tips to individuals coming from uh, various backgrounds, whether it is a mom returned, a mom, whether returned to the workforce or a mom in the workforce or individuals who are BIPOC, how can they uh, mitigate and get around recruitment bias in their processes? What, what tips do you have? Yeah, well, I guess, first of all, I'm like really sorry that that happened to you. That's terrible that that is absolutely terrible because what what does what one other person um their actions and whatever happened there really has no bearing on your candidacy it doesn't make any sense Mm -hmm. um it doesn't make any logical sense at all um i think i think the first thing we need to do is say like it's not right it's not fair and i would never in any way shape or form condone any of these sorts of sorts of practices so i think that's step one for me it's not right or fair so Let's be honest and upfront around that. Um, but it, but it's really real. It's it's really real, and I think it impacts job seekers in in more ways that they really understand. Because it, it wasn't really until I was behind the scenes of, of the hiring process that I I understood how like it is messed up. It is messed up what goes on sometimes, and so and so's cousin gets the interview because the relate like. It is messed up what goes on uh, behind the scenes. So I, I think, honestly, I, I think our first step is, is really one of awareness. I think it's very important to have these conversations um, and to understand what you in your own unique situation could possibly be up against. So you use the example of um, a mom returning to work or maybe someone who's in like the early phases of, of building her family. Um, I, I know I felt challenges there there too in my career. Um how be aware of how that might impact it's like you gotta get real with yourself about some stuff only you know like the fullness of this of the situation but get real with yourself and say like what could someone be assuming 
about me. I think that is the, mm. the first step. I think mm -hmm. if you're a, a newcomer or an international student and you're saying to yourself, you know what, um, you know, I'm, I'm now refining my capability in English or whatever is, I, I don't know, in your situation, but is the employer making assumptions about your communication skills? It's entirely possible. Do some searching. Like this is inward work to say, okay, what if I were that hiring manager, what are kind of kind of some of the key key things that I might be concerned about, rightly or wrongly? I'm not saying that it's right that a manager's like, you got an accent, I don't want to hire you. I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying that's real. So how are you going to deal with it? Um, so I, I think that's step one. Get real with yourself and and try seek to understand what you might possibly be up against. You might, even if you have a trusted colleague, um, a mentor, uh, a teacher, or a professor, or whoever, someone that you can trust and sort of thought partner around that, again, doing some real work on, um, on, on self-reflection, you might get some feedback from them as well. And then the, the next thing I would do is whatever the heck I can to mitigate stuff that might not be true. So for example, I'm an international student I have exceptional speaking skills, um, but I have a, a, a non-English sounding name. And I am concerned that employers are going to think I'm not proficient in the language. There are actual things that you could do to mitigate that very early in the process. For example, might you consider doing a YouTube video of yourself, like talking a little bit about your background and experience mm -hmm. and putting that on your featured section of your LinkedIn profile? as one example. So boom, that recruiter looks at your resume. They say, Oh, I'm not sure. Not sure if he's, you know, strong, uh, strong English speaker. That recruiter is creeping your, your LinkedIn profile and you can nip that objection right there. So, so there are steps that you can, um, you can take. I think of the mom, the whole mom demographic. One thing I, I, I would say is uh, through the transitions to and from maternity leave, I think I, I don't know if this is a universal thing, but I think a lot of women like take a hit in their career and their personal brand in terms of the overall perception of how dedicated and committed they are to their professional careers. Um, so we might take steps by staying like staying active on LinkedIn or staying connected to a colleague back at the office by participating in some volunteer thing. If, if that's in the cards for us, right? We always have to do what feels in alignment with where we are, who we are, and, and the time we have have to. Um, so those are a couple of things that I, I would, I would self-reflect, be like, what is it I'm possibly up against? And then are there actual tactical, tangible things I can do to mitigate anything that just seems like complete nonsense, right? Um, and do what you can with the resources that you have. Gotcha. The reason I was smiling earlier uh, during your feedback is I was recalling, if anyone's a fan of the movie Eight Mile, I'm a huge Eminem fan. That was a great movie. Uh, in his rap battle, you know, he he took away all the ammunition that his opponent would use to diss him and take him down in that rap battle. And he, you know, just spat it out, got it out of the way, and then proceeded to annihilate his opponent because he took all their ammunition away. And so Shauna's, you know, advice is basically do a real reflection on what the marketplace could uh, knock you for, downgrade you for, discriminate against, uh, discriminate against you for, and come up with your own mitigation strategy in terms of how to respond to that. And so if you want a great example, rewatch Eight Mile, go to that rap battle, see how Eminem handled it, or Bunny Rabbit, you know, in that case, and be your own B Rabbit and, you know, really hit employers where it hurts and by coming up with your own responses ahead of time to how they're going to try and take you down a peg. Awesome. I'm going to have to watch that battle. <laughs> I'm like, I haven't watched that movie in years. I can no yeah. more remember it. But this is exactly what I'm, what I'm describing. Like, exactly. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a really great example. Yeah. Awesome. I always love how you're able to tie hip hop into so many different things about career search and stuff like that. Nia, too. I think that's really cool. Okay. So, um... The next question is technically mine, but I know we're already running short on time. And I think the ones after that are a little bit more important to what we're really trying to get into today. So Nia too, do you want to pick up with your next question? And, and Yeah, we sure. All right, no doubt. Um, so diving right in, uh, what do you think about the relatively recent notion of culture ad as a concept uh, versus culture fit, which is what we were, we were all used to up until this point? And how do you advise a candidate to demonstrate their cultural ad as a candidate? Yeah, I think like, so 
So now knowing what I know about culture ad, the words culture fit are a little bit cringy. Like when we think about what that actually means and like that is common language, right? Like employers mm -hmm. will still use that. Like right now t today, they're still talking like that. Like he's not going to be a fit with my team. She's not going to be a culture fit with the company. Like that is still the, the common language. And it is completely cringy if, if we, um, if we think of what we're actually saying, which is come in and be just like me and in a company full of people just like, like me, don't be too different. Right. Um, but this whole notion of, of culture ad, I think is, I obviously, obviously a superior, a superior approach. Um, we all know that diversity leads to better outcomes in organizations. It absolutely leads to, um, to better outcomes. And I think as, as candidates, uh, as candidates, it's a tough, it's a tough sell right now because the concept is so new, especially if you're in a more traditional type market area that's really stemmed in old ways of doing things. So I, I think a great way to demonstrate culture ad without kind of like overtly demonstrating culture ad is to is to talk about um, interesting or unique solutions that you've proposed in your in your past experience so if you have introduced a new innovative idea that's outside of the box of typical ways of thinking um, in the company you're applying for those are stories that you want to highlight in the interview your unique approach your unique perspective is totally worth totally worth adding to um to the overall discussion so i'm all about this whole idea of of, of culture ad i i think I hope that we see the whole the whole acceptance. I think of these terms around cultural fit, um, really really demise over over time because I, I don't I don't think that I don't think that's the best uh, path forward for employers or for job seekers. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just see. Let me know if you agree with me on this or not. The way that I understood cultural ad is that you're looking uh, intentionally to bring new people onto the team that are going to progress or grow or add a new element or flavor to the current culture at the company, rather than putting, bring in people who will just simply slot in nicely and wouldn't, you know, just rock the boat or alter things too much in a qualitative manner that would bring so-called discord, you know, or disruption to the team. Um, and if you guys agree with that, that definition, then to your example, uh, in terms of how to, as a candidate, display that, it's really drawing upon what makes you unique or better, or let's say unique versus other people saying, oh, because the culture that I grew up in or the way that I was raised or the collection experience I've had, I developed this different lens through which I can attack this problem that I believe will be a value add to your company. And so what Sean is saying is how can you figure out ways to turn your differences into an asset and show an employer how there'll be a benefit to them rather than trying to just slot into their way of doing things, show how you can, you know, in a positive way, shake things up and take them in a new direction. Yes, ab absolutely. And I feel like it's, I feel like it's a, a tough thing um, for, a, for, a, for a new hire to take on a lot of the time. So when we go, when we go back to that conversation around, around um, like diversity and inclusion as a leadership competency, it's like, you got to have that too, right? Because we're now bringing new people into our organization with new perspectives. You're going to need some leadership support in order to ensure the success of that hire. Because I, I mean, there's, there's two, there's, there's many parts to it, but, but the two things, key things that are on my mind is, is like, it's one thing to go through like the recruitment process and hiring and onboarding and getting that person in the door. Um, but why are we going to go to all that trouble for a diverse hire if we don't have the support once they're in there um, to continue to bring the value of that, that culture ad piece and retain them over time. Right. So I'm like, mm -hmm. we can have both things in place right. in order for, for this to be worth anyone's while, I think. Yep. 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 Absolutely. 
All right, coming into the next question. Um, one of your recent YouTube videos was on the topic of name discrimination. And I know that we've touched on that a little bit already in this conversation. Um, the YouTube video that you did was about name discrimination and whether or not a candidate should change their quote unquote ethnic sounding name on their resume. Um, can you share more of your thoughts on pros and cons of, of doing that as well as ways, um, well, I guess we've already talked about ways to overcome that potential name bias, but if you have anything else to share on that topic, that would be really great. Yeah, I, this is like, so I teach in an MBA program and like most of the students in that MBA program, they're, they're not Canadian. So when I look at my class list, the list of names are like African, Chinese, Indian names, like very clear that they're not North American. Like it's, it's very clear. Um, and over time, after I got involved in the, the program for a little while, I, I just like kept hearing like stories from the students about like they would suspect that they weren't getting a job interview because of their name or, oh, it seems to make this employer uncomfortable because they can't pronounce it or whatever. It was like very anecdotal. And then I get kind of interested in the, in the topic. And the more research that I did, the more disturbing that I found this, this, um, this to be. So there, there's several studies conducted that say you're like two times more likely um, to be successful in your job search, if you are in, in North America, if you have a North American sounding name, you're going to get more interviews, you're, you're going to be more successful in your career, because you have a North American sounding name. Um, so I think as job seekers, you're faced a, a job seekers with a, a non North American sounding name, you're faced with a really tough decision. And I would never say that there's a right or a wrong way to approach this, I would say that you do you and whatever feels right for your situation. One approach and I've actually done it with, um, with some of my, my career clients is to change your name. So I've had clients actually say, I'm so frustrated with this job search. I actually, um, I actually am going to take the step to change my name to a North American sounding name on my resume for the purposes of getting an interview. And I've seen them have success. So imagine applying to a job under your given name, whatever, whatever the name is. And then saying, I am now, and I'm picking on John Smith, John Smith, you don't get an interview as you, and then you get an interview as John Smith. Okay. So it with the same a resume. Old, with the exact same resume. Like, what is that? So, so, but there's, there are actually studies that prove that this happens time and time again. Now you are faced with a whole bunch of like, how does that feel to have to do that? How does that feel to go work for an employer that screened you out based on your name? There are tons of inputs to that. So that is one approach. That candidates can take and then you know i don't think that's right or fair but the reality is there comes a point particularly when people are working through issues of immigration they need a freaking job so mm -hmm. it's it's like at this point i'm willing to try anything so that's one tactic that um that i've seen be successful and i've seen candidates um, go from no interviews to interviews from changing their name on their resume um, I think that that's something that we shouldn't take lightly. And I would never counsel someone that they have to do that. I think that that's a choice that's deeply, deeply personal. Um, and if it feels right, and it's going to help you get to where you need to be, by all means, do it and then get in there and affect some change, right? Affect some change. I'd be like day one, filling out my paperwork. Yes. And from now on, I'll be going by my full given Indian name. And you can figure out how to pronounce it. So, right, it's, I think it's deeply personal. But this is one tactic that, um, that job seekers um, can take if they're, if they're at sort of that point where it's like, I, I just can't get an interview and I, I think my name's holding me back. Mm. Yeah. Um, in, in you sharing that, you said that, you know, you guided people to try and do that if it felt uh, right to them. And I, I, I was thinking about it is, I don't know if it ever feel right, but it might feel necessary. So I just want to introduce that that nuance there. Cause uh, if we look at my name, Niatsu Ben Siential, clearly it's not American, it's not North American. And you know, there's pride in my name that my mother gave me. We all have pride in our names, you know, that our parents just chose to bestow on us. And so I just want us to sit with the weight of the fact that there are professionals today in years gone by, I've had to literally sit there and decide if they're going to change the name that their parents bestowed on them in order to get work. Mm -hmm. So just, just feel that for a moment before we move on. That's your identity. There's nothing more personal than your name as far as your identity is concerned. 
And so to have to contemplate changing in order to get a job, I hope will impress upon everyone listening the depth of the problem that we're dealing with. And hopefully we can start to make moves to change it so that people never have to contemplate parting with a piece of their identity or screening it or masking it in order to get in the door for a job. I think that's a really, really deep concept, and I appreciate you sort of taking the time to put more weight on that. Um, Shauna, I know we're just past 45 minutes. We have two final questions. Can we quick fire those at you real quick? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, if, if you woke up tomorrow and the one thing that you feel is really broken in the hiring process was fixed, what do you think that thing would be? There would be diversity on, on the hiring side of the table as well. Like I, I would see some, it's, it's someone with this leadership capability around diversity and inclusion. I don't care what they look like. They're white, black, brown, purple. I don't care. They have, they have uh, diversity and inclusion in their skill set when they're going through and screening the resumes and making any sort of hiring decisions. Love Great. it. Then a final question, if you could reveal one employer insider secret to job seekers that would help them get hired more quickly, what would it be? Yeah, um, the action isn't on the job board. The action is in your, your professional network, for sure. It's, it's, in, it's in who you know. There's way more hiring and recruitment and meaningful conversations going on behind the scenes with people you know or someone who knows someone who knows someone. Um, then, then you're ever going to find by just going on to uh, one of the big job boards and, and applying your resume. So behind the scenes stuff, we're already talking about who we want to hire for that job from the employer perspective. Know someone, get in on those conversations because we're already partway through the process by the time it's on the job board. Really, really quickly, uh, company job board on the company website versus job board. Is there a slightly higher likelihood a job seeker will get traction applying directly on the company site? versus uh, an external third-party job site. Sorry, say, do you, do you, are you asking me if there is? Yeah, yeah. Like, do I, I have a better yeah, chance yeah. if I go through your portal versus Indeed.com, for example? I don't think so. Like, because they kind of, they kind of come together anyways. At the end of the day, like, what the recruiter is seeing the, is the pool of the resumes. Um, what I would be careful of, of as a job seeker, though, is being aware like how many times I'm applying to the same company. I won't forget it. One time, one time in my corporate job, I logged in. I'm looking at this candidate's application. She seemed pretty good for the job. Then I go and I can see every other job she applied for. And she had applied for like 52. It was a clear to me that the candidate didn't know what was up, didn't have any clear target. She looked desperate. Um, I, I think it doesn't matter where they're applying, but at the end of the day, um, I think you got to be aware of how many times you're applying and applying only to roles that are actually aligned with what you want to do and your skill set. All right. Great feedback. Thank you so much. Yes, Shauna, thank you so much. We will go ahead and let you go. I really appreciate it. I know we both do. Um, your insights today have just been really, really valuable. And for you to take the energy and the time and the effort uh, that it takes to really share those parts of yourself is, is, is really valuable and really important. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys, for having me and send me those list of questions and we'll be happy to contribute and get uh, those answers back to you uh, to the audience. I hope I have I hope I have new friends on LinkedIn. So thank you so much. <laughs> thanks so much for having me, guys. Yeah. You Death are welcome, Shana, guys. <laughs> All right. You heard her. Bye -bye. Bye. Bye. All right. You heard her. If you have more questions, you got a couple more minutes to get those into the chat. This was really a fantastic conversation. Nia, too, do you have any closing words, thoughts, ideas? Um, sure. Um, I think that, you know, this is one of many conversations that need to continue in this area. Um, if there are any individuals on this call with leadership responsibility have access to the, to the gatekeepers who are in recruiting themselves, I hope that you took away uh, some good tips that you can leverage and implement within your own recruiting practices. For example, diversifying the recruitment team itself, um, having the that recruitment team go through uh, DEI training, for example. But really, at the end of the day, really starts with us. What are our own attitudes, biases, stereotypes we hold internally? Bring those to awareness and try and see how those might be manifesting your behavior, your choices, and your actions as leaders, as recruiters. And 
and try to mitigate for them. We all have inner work to do, myself included. Um, and it's really important that we lean into that in order for us to progress as individuals and therefore affect change within our organizations. It really starts with us at the individual level. Yep, I love that personal accountability. That's something for me that I've always felt. It's like we hear about, you know, if, if everybody did this or if everybody did that, and I take that to heart really, really heavily. I, I think to myself, Eh, it might be easier if I didn't do this thing that I know is the right thing, <laughs> but I won't feel good about myself if, mm -hmm. if I don't do that, you know? And so I really like that focus on, on personal accountability. I think it's really, really important. And I think we're starting to open our eyes more. I hope that that's true anyway. I hope that people inside companies, especially who have those, those uh, uh, powers to, to make change and make decisions. Um, I think that we're, the, the narrative is starting to, to shift, you know, it, it should have happened much earlier. Um, and it's probably not happening as fast as, as it should be. Um, but I, I hope that, you know, people like you, me, the other people out there who are talking about these issues, I hope that that starts to, to, make a difference to people and, and make people think about those things. Yep. All right, everyone. I think that is it for us. I will have uh, contact information for Shauna, Niatu, and myself after, or once we, um, take ourselves off the stream before we actually <laughs> quit going live. Sorry, I'm a little bit tongue tied today. Um, but I think this was a really fantastic conversation. Nia too, thank you as always for bringing so much value as well. And uh, to everyone, I will see you next week on uh, Career Tip Tuesdays, regular day, regular time. And Nia too will be back again with us next month on the second Tuesday. All right, thank you guys good. so much. Take care, everybody. <laughs>